Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly 90 minute deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. My name is Lisa. I'm a clinical psychologist and a college counselor. I am a parent of a boy in elementary school, a girl in middle school, and a girl in college. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, does calculus count too much in college admissions? A great article by Scott Jason of Inside Higher Ed and Edon Lieber of the New York Times. Our questions from a listener are question number one. How common is it on today's campuses that they give credit for APIB but still require a distribution requirement in the same subject area? I am trying to minimize unnecessary stress for my kid. That's Bobby from Ohio. Our question number two is from Victoria, uh, from Melinda from North Carolina, and that is, how common is it for colleges to tell you that they are test optional, but they really aren't completely test optional? And our question number three is anonymous. It's, are all books equal, or do some count more than others? How can we know which ones count the most? Our interview is the final part, part two of two, with Chris Gruber the Vice President and Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at Davidson College on how the pandemic forced Davidson to examine its own admission biases and make changes. And our college spotlight is understanding Danish universities with international specialist Kevin Newton. And that is the final part two of two. Yes, friends. And just a couple announcements. One is if you have a federal loan through the federal loan system, once again, they have extended the pause through August meaning you are not accruing any interest. And so uh, loan forgiveness advocates are pushing for, for that loan debt to just be abrogated. Um, that hasn't happened so far, but interest has not accumulated now for a couple years um, in, light of, in light of the pandemic. And I, last week, if you missed last week, I made the big announcement that my brother from another mother will be switching to monthly when his daughter gets back. When's Lauren get back from, from Yale, Dave? June? Uh, she gets back at the end of May. They have they they have an early uh, early end to their semester. So that's acting great. like Southern schools, man. That's what we do here. We let you yeah, out in absolutely. May. Absolutely. <laughs> the Florida, some of the Florida schools let you out in April. <laughs> Avoid they that heat. Escape that summer heat. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So we are um, very very close to having an announcement of what our new format will be uh, moving forward. I'll I'll definitely have an update for you next week on that. Uh, All right, so we're going to transition to our tip, and then uh, for our, I do have something about the vernacular. So for all this time, I've been quizzing Dave, and he's been flunking miserably, and I've been enjoying it. Absolutely, yeah, we've been pulling (laughs) stuff out of thin air. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm gonna um, the next one you get right. I'm gonna move to a format where I just announce it and move on. And the reason for that is. I have so many people that I want to interview that right now our interviews are so backed up. I want to go to a longer interview, like a 30 minute interview rather than like a 15 or 17 minute interview. And so I'm going to try to move through our, our intro just a little faster, but I'm such a good guy that I don't, I want to stop with you getting the last guess, right? All right. (laughs) So I have one you might get this week. We'll see. All right. For the admissions tip. I know last week I said, I'm going to be giving you several tips coming forward about writing because now's the time for juniors to start working on their personal statements. Um, By the way, if you're one of the students I work with and a lot of people I I work with listen to this podcast, reminder, tell your student, I expect it's April 15th has come and passed. I expect your your, your child to have completed the profile section, the family section, the education section, the activity section. And if your tests are done, the testing section on your common app. And your resume. I've sent you links for all of that. It's time to transition to the personal statement. So I just had to get that in, Dave. This is one way I can reach people at one time. So I've never done that before. But if it's effective, I'm going to do it. Because they can apply to any listener as well. You should, If you want to know what pacing you should be on now, that's good pacing for any junior. uh, So that you'll have a very 
stress less senior year. But I'm going to pass on giving a writing tip this week just because there's another tip that is very time sensitive. May 1st is National Candidate Reply Day. Seniors have to make decisions. I'm spending a lot of time with my students, helping them be a sounding board as they're down to the final two and three schools. So here's a tip. Find the closest alumni chapter to you and talk to alumni about their experience, the network, and anything you want about their college. They love talking to students, and it's a great way to get a perspective. So look up the local alumni chapter and pick their brains about their experience, changes at the school, and what the network's like. A little tip there that can sometimes uh, point you in one direction over another. It's not, it's not a game changer, but it's worth doing. All right, Dave, vernacular. Here's the word. Okay. Vanity application. Vanity. Okay, I'm going to guess that someone's putting in an application to a school that they really don't need or they're really not interested in, but they're just doing it just because they want to get the euphoria of getting accepted or something like that. Bingo, bingo, winner, winner, chicken dinner, right. man. I can retire the guessing game with a successful right. final. <laughs> Going out on top. Like yeah, you went out on top. I gave you a bust at your chops, but I let you go out on top. So, you know, so, you know, I have these students who, and they're very transparent with me, and I really appreciate their transparency, but they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm really not that interested in designer you, but I just want to be able to say I got in. That's a vanity application. <laughs> Unfortunately, usually they can see right through that, and it doesn't usually work. But that's a vanity application. Good job. All right, big number. A recent NACAC study said 38% of colleges – say that math is a requirement for four, all four years. And that number goes up as you move up sort of the select tip, selectivity spectrum. So the point being this, if you're thinking of dropping math after three years, you've almost ruled out four in 10 colleges right off the jump. So big number, 38% of schools require math for all four years. And that number goes up as you move into more selective institutions. All right, Dave. Speaking about math, that's a little segue into our calculus talk. Take it away, my friend. And now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. It is a great article. It's Does Calculus Count Too Much in Admissions? It's by Scott Jasek, a familiar name in Inside Higher Ed. And it says, new report says it does. Uh, it does count too much, and Admissions Association agrees. So do a lot of mathematicians. So what is this report? The report is by, quote, Just Equations and the National Association for College Admission Counseling. And what they said is for many students, the most important math course is, interestingly, not calculus, but it's statistics. But for decades, calculus has been considered the gold standard that students must meet for most highly selective colleges. But there's a big problem. The first problem is that A, not all high schools offer calculus. B, access to calculus today is highly stratified by both race and income. C, few colleges and universities actually stipulate calculus as a universal requirement for admission, and e, uh, D, it's not even included in many states' high school math requirements. Yet applicants with calculus uh, are, uh, uh, applicants with, uh, are often told that calculus is necessary for their transcript to, on their transcript to be considered for college. Okay, but here's a surprise. Most math and science experts support the report's uh, recommendations that we de-emphasize calculus. Now, so what does this report say? It first says, quote, that only 19% of high school graduates actually complete calculus. And this number varies immensely by both race and also by socioeconomic standing. In fact, only 50%, 50 of Asians complete calculus, 22% of whites, 14% of Latinos, and 9% of Blacks. And not surprisingly, this is socioeconomically co correlated. In the highest socioeconomic quintile, the top 
37% of the students took calculus, but in the lowest quintile, only 9% took it. Okay? And here's the interesting thing. When students were asked, why are you taking calculus? It was not for the love of the math. 81% said because it looked good on a college transcript. But here's the deal. Fewer than 5% of colleges actually require calculus. It goes up, 21% require it, specifically for engineering, physical sciences, math, and technology and business uh, majors. Uh, but however, and they say this quote, because calculus is the gold standard, people in the bit, people are using calculus as the gold standard in admissions as a form of shortcut to trying to select the most highly qualified students. Now this report actually praised two uh, university systems, the UC system and Stanford, for changing their official requirement and de-emphasizing calculus. And the National Associations of Mathematics actually agreed with this. And I'm going to conclude with this quote and then throw it open to you, Mark. And their quote is, the ultimate goal of the K-12 math curriculum should not be to get students into and through calculus by the 12th grade. Instead, the aim should be to have established the mathematical foundations that will enable students to pursue whatever course of study that interests them when they get into college. So let me throw that open to you, Mark, and see what you'd like to add. First thing I want to say is A++++ summary. You, know, you nailed everything. Thanks, my friend. It's an interesting conversation. And so the article looks at perhaps what should be versus what really is. So what they're saying should be true is that things have evolved and actually statistics and data science correlate a lot better with courses in the life sciences. And sure, calculus is very important, especially for, for things like engineering, um, just like physics is, and oftentimes for higher level math, computer science, various disciplines. But they're saying that there should be more precision and we shouldn't be just be using this blunt instrument that calculus is the best path for everything because it's not. And that this thinking hasn't evolved, but courses has, have evolved and data science is blowing up. It's more popular than ever. And it's more relevant to more college majors um, and statistics as well than calculus. Um, and the interesting thing is when you read this, you think, well, this is probably something that's going to be pushed and promoted by like some advocates of the humanities or the social sciences or the visual performing arts. But it's, it's often math professionals and math and science professional associations who are agreeing with this. Um, here's one quote from the article. Pro pro proponents of these new options note that they are more reflective of how math is used in many careers. Data, science itself, a discipline that employs statistical methods and programming to answer questions using real-world data, is not just a new course, but a flourishing new college discipline and profession. Uh, over the past decade, math and science professional associations and national councils have been making a case for broadening these math pathways for high school and college. Um, and then they say calculus just is an easy answer to a complicated question. It says institutions are just simply looking for a gatekeeper. Um, however, here's the problem and here's the dilemma. They're talking about maybe the way life should be and maybe what they want it to be. And as Dave recounted, the UCs, they've literally gone in and they've changed their grading rating system so that statistics is on par with calculus in the way in which they assign rigor. However, that is so by far the exception. Um, Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, that's a liberal arts and science school, 79% of students come in with calculus. Georgia Tech, right here in Atlanta, where I met, 97% of all students come in with calculus. And I'm just really familiar with tech because it's you know around the corner. S similar st stats would would most likely be true for UIUC, University of Illinois, and uh, Purdue, and University of Washington, and many, many, many other, Texas, many, many other schools in the country. But so, so you have this dilemma between maybe what should be and what is. 
Um, here's a quote. It's a longer quote, but I want to read it because I think it captures uh, the tension. It says, until these newer sequences are considered on par with the calculus path, which remains uncommon at selective universities, they will remain in the shadow of calculus, their growth held in check, regardless of how much students learn from them. For new math pa pathways to take hold, they must be regarded by high schools as rigorous college prep options, and students pursuing those pathways must be rewarded in the college admissions process. And it goes on to say, as math education evolves to reflect the realities of the new technologies and careers, there's a disconnect between what many of the academic departments that are propelling these new innovations and the college admissions offices that determine who their future students will be. The awareness by many departments in the sciences, social sciences, humanities of the values of these new types of quantitative analysis skills has yet to be permeated into the admission offices, particularly at many elite private um, institutions whose practices have outsized influence in the field. And as long as colleges and high schools still view calculus as a singular sign of academic status, students and families seeking entry to the most competitive campuses will continue to view the course as a down payment on their ticket to get in. And so, um, so that's, that's kind of, kind of where the dilemma is. And then, you know, it goes on to give some more stats. So I'll, I'll read this. It says, Statistics is not universally recognized as rigorous, particularly when it comes to more selective schools. Now, one of the nice things about this article that Dave read, it's a summary from a NACAC survey that was done. So the survey actually tested to see what people actually think. Let's not just assume this, but let's find out what the data shows. So here's what some of the stats show. It says that AP stats, it did squeak into the top four on courses uh, with the most weight in admissions, but it was only cited by half as many professionals as calculus. So half as many as, as being a rigorous course. And it was actually ranked lower than pre-calc when it came to rigor. It says the majority, 61% of respondents said stats is not as rigorous as calculus. And with private colleges, it was 65% said calculus not as rigorous as colleges. So as people talk about putting emphasis on data science, statistics, and there's even some other newer maths. There's a social justice math. There's personal finance math. I went, Dave, I went back and read the full report that this thing came from. So I'm pulling some of the stats off of that. Um, you know, you, you just, you're just going to have this quandary because there's a disconnect. As long as the incentives are in the direction of calculus, then all these studies can emerge and they're not going to make a difference um, because... Uh, what what's what gets rewarded is what gets done. Thoughts, Dave? Yeah, I think that the phrase is gatekeeper. The fact is calculus is like airport security. And when you have a situation now where in the top selective colleges, the acceptance rate is sub 5%. Uh, and in, in the many institutions, the top ones, it's going to 3 to 4%. The fact is, is calculus is just a convenient way of screening out 80 plus percent of your applicants. There's a lot of reasons why that might be bad and not reflective and not relevant for many things, but that's just the reality of the situation. And with the test optional SAT uh, movement in full swing, calculus as a gatekeeper is not going to go away anytime soon. That's just the reality. Now, here's the problem. You know, if you're in urban school, if you are in a decent but not highly uh, selective public school, there's a good chance that your kid will never get to calculus if they just get on the regular math track that that school offers. There's a good chance that the only way that your kid will get to calculus, period, is if he does it in the summers utilizing either other uh, schools or courses or Khan Academy and so forth. And that really sucks. And the fact is that that's that that you know that needs to be addressed. We know it does, but but for now, if you want to get your kid into the top school, he absolutely has to take calculus and do well in it. And my suggestion with with our daughter, she was on an advanced math track from the fourth grade because we had some great counseling to that effect, and we supplemented her by actually taking math classes in the summer. Uh, through John Hopkins has great programs, Northwestern, Khan Academy has great free programs. And, you know, we used it as an advantage. 
So several things. I agree with everything you said. I, I will aspire that not everybody has to go to these most selective schools. Most schools accept 67% of applicants. So this is a lot of conversation around aspiring for the most selective schools. Uh, but that's not where everybody is, and I, I can't say that enough. Like you said, it, it oftentimes is a gatekeeper. Now, we oftentimes talk about how people miss opportunities just off of their courses. So keep that in mind. Like, look, just let's take those stats I shared. 97% of people at Georgia Tech, 79% at Wesleyan come in with Calc. I'm going to break those percentages you gave down by different populations. Just put this in perspective in, in terms of what that means. Like, you don't take the right courses. So one out of every 11 black kids has calculus. One out of every seven Latino kids has calculus. One out of every five high school students in general, that's true, by the way, for men and women. I've looked at the numbers. It's like 19.2% and 19.5%. So there's not any gender difference there. One, in every, one out of every five white kids has calculus. You've blown yourself out by your curriculum. And yeah. then 50.3%. Uh, which to me, it's, it was a stunning statistic because yeah. – I mean, you take take the remember the minorities are minorities. So with African Americans, that's only ten percent of the population, or thirteen percent. But when you're saying that overall, I mean, when 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 four out of five white kids don't take calculus, it, it's no wonder where you see an overrepresentation of Asians because half of the Asians are taking calculus. Yep, 50. And in, in a very STEM focused society, you, you know, how can you compete? if you're not even taking the courses necessary to get into the STEM-based uh, curriculum. So it, I was actually quite stunned by the disparities. Well, by the way, I, I, I noticed how you talked about how you found free programs. I know how you are, Dr. Lincoln Penny, man. Oh, I knew man, you were going to yeah, find yeah. the free programs out there. <laughs> well, well to, to your point, Mark, when I first started this process, uh, you, you know, if you went to John Hopkins uh, or to Northwestern, sign up a summer calculus course, you know, you were talking about twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars just for that course itself, which would have been prohibitive for a vast majority of middle class, working class families. The I, I, I do think that con economy and the associated free web offerings have been completely revolutionary in in in. Um, equalizing the, the playing field as far as access to additional uh, math education. So hands out, to, uh, you know, hat, hats off to Khan Academy for, for, for really leveling that field. Yeah, I, wa I wanted to crack on you for, for John Hopkins instead of Johns Hopkins again. Yeah. <laughs> but then I went back, I listened to the whole spotlight I did on College of Worcester, and I struggle with that name, and I call it College of Worcester the whole time, and I struggle with saying Worcester, not Worcester. So you know that saying. Karma is a B I T C H. I guess I guess I have to shut up on uh, busting on you on John Hopkins if I can't even say Worcester right and I do a spotlight on it. I I, I say with College of Worcester, you're just out of luck to be named after a popular sauce, steak sauce, my man. <laughs> 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 to me, you're always going to be Worcester sauce. <laughs> oh, it's so funny because there's a WPI, you know, <laughs> that's, that's right. it's up there in Massachusetts, and there's the one in. In Ohio, they're both tricky. <laughs> they're both tricky schools for me to pronounce. Awesome. You know, the last thing I want to say is this is why, you know, sometimes people wonder, like, why Why sometimes is this, you know, are you doing a session with a 7th or 8th grader? Well, the standard sequencing in a lot of schools is Algebra 1 in ninth grade, Geometry in 10th, Algebra 2 in 11th, and Pre-Calc in 12th. And if you're on that path, you've uh, you've missed calculus unless you either do a summer accelerated course or you you're at a school that offers a double course. Like we had two years in one course uh, for super bright kids that could handle it, or they could take two years of math and they could skip ahead. But unless you have some kind of course like that or you do summer class, you're not going to get to calculus unless you're doing Alg one in middle school. And so this is why this whole curriculum planning really needs to start in middle school if you have a child that's, that's capable. Like, we're not advocating putting your child in over their head. You don't want the curriculum to be overwhelming. But there are so many kids that are perfectly capable, they just, they just don't know this stuff. And so they go in, they take Algebra, in, algebra 1 in the ninth grade, and they end up at pre-calc, and they could have just as easily ended up at calc. 
but Mark, let me let me emphasize this. For about 80% of the families out there, if you want to get your child into the uh, rigorous calculus program to get into these selective schools, you have to consider supplementary education uh, in addition to the school. And I'm talking about uh, summer school courses, online courses. There's a lot of offerings, but the vast majority of schools, public schools, just do not have the strength of curricula to get your child onto that math track. And secondly, it has to start early. And I'm talking about third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, because math is a cumulative experience. You just can't catch up uh, or advance. Uh, the, the last tip I want to leave parents is, ironically, the best chance to advance your children in math is in the elementary years. It's far easier to get a second grader to do third grade math or fourth grade math than to get a, a someone in seventh or eighth grade to advance into high school math. So the earlier you can advance your child in math, the better. I often tell patients when they're in the kindergarten, get them on the first grade. When they're in the second grade, get them on the fourth grade. So that when they get to the fifth and sixth grade, they're already several years ahead so they can start taking pre-algebra in the sixth and seventh grade. By the time they get to seventh grade, eighth grade, they're on geometry. By the time they're uh, in the ninth and tenth grade, they're already de doing pre-calculus. So the advancement must start years ahead. Not You, you just can't ca uh, advance in, in one or two summers. And that's a good uh, segue for me saying I'm going to have an interview later, later on um, toward the end of the summer uh, with someone who's come up with an absolute fantastic way of teaching math to elementary kids and the the results are incredible and i found this out because so many of those students i worked with were going through a program and they were like literally blowing out the sats like 780s to 800s on their mass and they were telling me that started with what they did in with um with this program in middle school and so i'm going to have the, the founder of this program she's been on good morning america before promoting it and um so if you have a, an elementary school child or if you can pass it on to others you can basically put in place what dave said but it's a way that's like fun it's like games using games to do it so it's fun for kids so we'll be hearing more about that about that later the last thing i want to say is you do have to be careful so so dave when kara started ninth grade um they had originally put her into algebra and i went full lisa on them and if you heard our last episode, Lisa spoke up about what she's done and had to get an attorney uh, with 504 plans not being properly treated for one child and, and threatening for a second child to get the school district to comply with the rules and regs. I went full blown on them. And I didn't, no, I didn't go off on them. I just challenged it. And then they reevaluated and they said, no, you're right. She, she should be. So she got in geometry in ninth and then she ended up at calculus. But if I had not intervened as a parent, if I just let them place her where they were trying to place her, I knew that she could handle, I knew that she had already mastered algebra. So whatever reason, they were going to put her in algebra in ninth. And I, and so sometimes you do have to be a little bit of a squeaky wheel. So that's Absolutely. another thing. But once again, you don't want to put your kid in over their head. I've seen that too. I've seen parents that come in and say, my kid needs to be here and the kid doesn't need to be there. And then they drown. Dave's daughter... Uh, she went in the hardest class at the lab school that very, very, very few people went in and she crushed it. Um, and that's one of the things that helped her with the selective options that she had. But Dave will tell you that Lauren was not a math whiz in the third grade. Remember, Dave, you said no, that. No. no, she didn't. In fact, <laughs> in fact, I remember uh, one of the, in order to get into some of the online courses, she had to take uh the SETs in the sixth grade. It sounds crazy, but even though, you know, the fact is it's, it's a requirement. And I remember, you know, she went into her school, she was doing great on math, and then we, we had her sit for like a two-hour test in, in the sixth grade. She came in all crying. She said, Daddy, that was so hard. I've never had anything that hard. <laughs> and I was total Simon Cowell, like, suck it up, kid. Yeah, you I know. You're Tiger years. Dad over here. I call <laughs> I you Tiger Dad. I don't know if you're Dr. Lincoln Penny or Tiger Dad. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, it was hard. Good. <laughs> You'll learn to like it. <laughs> Dave doesn't realize how fortunate it is that he never got a strong-willed child that bucks him in every step of the way. <laughs> Lauren is like the sweetest thing. Dave can tell her to jump, and she just says how high. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
I don't know. That's another story. <laughs> yeah. But she's starting to, you know, you, what happens when you go to these schools? You know, it's funny. I was talking with Karis the other day. And she said, you know, the best thing I got out of Davidson? He taught me critical thinking skills. And did they ever? Because that means they start pushing back on you and challenging all the ways in which they're raised. Yeah, well, t- two days after she got into college, she goes to her mom and I and says, oh, by the way, I don't want to be a doctor. And like, now you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> she just played you all along, man. She did. She was like, now I'm in college. Get off my back. <laughs> <laughs> played you like a fiddle. That's right. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Friends, I'm here with Lisa. And, you know, Lisa knows me so well that when I said I was doing this series on what will surprise you within the admission office, she's like, you're going to need a fourth session. I just know you. You're going to need a fourth session. So (laughs) I said, no, I'm not. So what I'm doing, basically proving her right. I'm continuing to share new things I think of at the start of my sessions with Lisa. So you kind of get an admissions tip with Dave, and then you get kind of another one with Lisa. Is that okay, Lisa? That sounds great. (laughs) You know, I'll just spread it out over time. Bite-sized chunks. Well, you know what I realized? Like, that session, I was so passionate about. I mean, I literally did three 40-minute sessions. That's why those are like two-hour episodes. Because they really kind of distill the essence of what the podcast is about. The podcast yes. is about trying to bridge the gap, you know, between like what people think and, and the way things really work. And so it kind of just gets it to the core. So here's one that I, I don't I didn't share. I have been really surprised. Now, this is a little bit more of a temporary one. Pleasantly surprised how much schools have really exercised grace because of covid. And so there were more than a few people this year I worked with that got in that I, if I had to bet, I would have thought they wouldn't have gotten in. And and the reason why is because there was some evidence of low grades, like with working online and all of that stuff at some point, and then they wrote about it. And then I've been talking to some admission officers more recently, especially some senior ones. And one of them even termed it. They said, Mark, we have a term for it, COVID grace. We call it COVID (laughs) grace. (laughs) And so that's, a, you know, more of a little bit of a temporary one, but still one that I think our listeners might be encouraged to hear because there's a lot of people that just did not do well in an online environment where nobody's coming out with their camera and it's just really hard to learn. And I'm really finding schools are sympathetic to that. Mm-hmm. So that's my one for the day. All right. Awesome. Well, we've got three questions. Take it away. All right. So here's the first question, and it comes to us from Bob Yee from Ohio. And she asks, how common is it on today's campuses that they give credit for AP or IB, but still require a distribution requirement in the same subject area? I am trying to minimize unnecessary stress for my kid. So, Bobby, I think we have some good news for you here. It is ex- That would be extremely rare. Like, I never want to say you know, make absolutes ever with schools because every school can come up and create their own policies. But for those of you who are not following um, Bobby's question, let's just kind of give a big picture overview. There there are three really common uh, models you'll see out there when it comes to curriculum. There's some others, but these are the three most popular ones. One is what Lisa had at Chicago, the core curriculum, you know, where a lot of courses that you have to take, especially during your first couple of years, everybody has to be exposed to a certain ma- amount of constancy, I would say, within the curriculum so that everybody has a base. And then you go all the way to the other extreme, you have open curriculum, where other than in your major, there's almost no requirements. I mean, some school may have like a writing course or something. And so that would be schools like Hamilton and Smith and Amherst and Brown and Wesleyan, but there's not very many schools like that. It's a short list. So most schools are in the middle and like 90% plus are in the middle. And what they do is they have distribution requirements. And so it's, they don't have, you know, as many required courses as you'll see in a core curriculum, but they don't provide this total flexibility in the open curriculum. So like, for example, if somebody wants to be, let's just say a chemistry major, they still have to take maybe one course in the humanities, 
maybe one course in the social sciences, one in visual or performing arts, maybe a computer science course, a writing course, some exposure to the broader breadth of knowledge out there. Uh, but the thing about that is a lot of times I'll work with students and they'll say, oh, I need an open curriculum. Why? I hate math. I do not want to take it ever again. And there's this impression that they have that they're going to be taking all of these courses outside of their major. And the way it actually normally works, even for schools with distribution requirements, is they'll literally be like, depends on the size of school, of course, but 50 or 60 courses oftentimes, and you can pick one from that list. And there's such variety and range in there that most people are kind of stressing over something that's not going to be that much of a stressor. They'll be able to find something off that list. They'll be like, oh, I didn't know that was going to be offered as an option for me. I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. So the thought that you would take, let's just, I'm going to keep in the chemistry realm, take an AP chemistry course, let's say, get credit for it, and then have to come in and then be required to have to take another exact chemistry course as part of a requirement that's going to be pretty rare unless you're looking at majoring at something pretty, but like very, very similar to that. So the answer to the question is that would be extremely rare, but you can never say never. All right. Almost definitive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be short and sweet because yeah. I know we got three today. <laughs> All right. Well, um, the next question is from Melinda from North Carolina, and she tells us tale about her daughter, Victoria. So Victoria applied early admission to to Auburn. We thought it would be an easy yes with her 4.7 unweighted GPA, yikes, after senior year. However, she applied test optional because her score is 1260 on the SAT. Auburn deferred her. The college counselor at our school and I were completely shocked when they did not accept her. Our college counselor called the admissions officer for our area. She said they do not look at anything except grades and test scores. They did not consider anything else in the application. The Auburn admissions officer encouraged Victoria to send in her test scores. She said her full file would be considered for admission in March. She has not sent her scores yet, but she plans to this week. In hindsight, Victoria remembers our tour guide at Auburn in July hinting that Auburn says it's test optional, but not really. She didn't say it that way, but Victoria realizes now that's what she meant. Um, and then she sent us an update. Victoria sent in her scores in late February and was accepted on March 4th. Unfortunately, the delay caused her to miss out on Auburn scholarship opportunities. How common is this? We wish we had really known that they were not actually test optional. Yeah, my heart really goes out to Melinda and Victoria here uh, because... I can only imagine how confusing it has to be for everybody trying to figure out, are you really test optional? You say you are, but are you really? I mean, just just the simple fact that schools say we're test optional, but if your scores are good, they'll be considered, tends to create the impression, well, how, are you really? You're telling me scores are good? Are you really test optional? And so it does create mass confusion mass confusion. So time for one of my corny illustrations that Anika used to hate. <laughs> <laughs> I will hate it in her stead. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so if I said to you, hey, Lisa, I know your brother's married. Do you trust his wife? You like you would probably say yes. But in reality, there's degrees of trust, right? Like do you trust her as much as you trust your own mom? Probably not. Do you trust her that if you turn your back on her, she's not going to mug you and and <laughs> kidnap you? Yeah. So there's like degrees. There's like degrees of trust, and that's kind of how I look at the whole test optional thing. So I'll just tell you how I approach it and see if this works for you guys. So on the one hand, of extreme trust for me are going to be. Um, schools like Dickinson and F and M and College of Worcester and Bates and Bowden and places that have been test optional long before the pandemic, um, because they have been reading in a test optional environment for a really long time, and we're all creatures of habit. I know from talking to admission officers who 
more recently went test optional, they've talked about how, hey, we're getting used to it now. And it's like, it's not that bad. We like it. Like, so the learning curve picks up over time. So they're going to be the ones I'm going to trust the most. You know, the ones that say that have been test optional pre-pandemic. Um, of course, I'm going to trust anybody that's gone test blind or, you know, score free because they don't even see scores, even if you want them to see scores. So they don't even see them like they literally block them out. So that so I'll put that in the same category as like the long termers, like maximum amount of trust. Next, I'm going to trust the ones that um, they went test optional in the pandemic because now we're getting into our multiple cycles here. It's not the first time going through it. And but when they did it, they made a long term commitment like they either said we are test optional in perpetuity or, you know, um, because what that tends to reveal is that they have long wanted to do this for a long time. And the pan- they just kind of use the pandemic as an excuse to do it. And I trust those schools more now than I did in 2020 when it first broke out, because, you know, depending on on the on um, the age of the student and the age of the family hearing this when you hear this. This might, by the time your child goes through, it might be their fourth cycle being in a test optional, you know, test optional readers are their third cycle. So I test that, I trust them the second most. There's still some schools that have not declared whether or not they're test optional for 2023. I don't trust them that much because that's pretty bad. Like you think about, think about a junior, you're a parent of a junior and it's mid April and you don't know whether you need to be preparing them for test scores for the next year for certain schools that you're interested in, the ones that haven't made a decision yet, th- what that indicates to me is they really want test scores, but they're just weighing the marketing value of being test optional. And they're trying to decide whether the marketing value of being test optional outweighs the value of getting the scores. So that you know that would be that category. Now, the ones I trust the least. The ones I trust the least are the big public schools that have been doing admissions by the numbers. They literally have been making admissions decisions by test scores and GPA. And now you've taken half of their evaluative factors away from them. Um, Those schools tend to not have really large admission offices. Um, They've been doing admissions rote for a long time. I'm just I'm leery of of them. Now, I do know some some schools in like take for example University of Georgia. University of Georgia went test test optional 2020 cycle. Or I get my cycles mixed up. Like 2021, I guess. And then this they just barely went here like 2022 after not being test optional. Of course, these big schools, keep in mind these big state schools, is the decisions aren't being made by the admissions offices. They're being made really on the board level, um, well above them. They don't have any say in it at all. Um, but I did have many people I saw that got in that wouldn't have got in with test scores. Um, but I'm still skeptical about them because they're just not used to using all the other factors that the schools that do more holistic admissions use and put the time in to really do research and really get to know the, a student. And I'm, I'm giving all this background because I know in the question, I know Melinda asked us to, one comment on is this rare, but also get the word out to others so that others don't get hoodwinked. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I'm taking time to go through this kind of, kind of grid and how I look at it. Yeah. And then there is another group that, like like MIT, I was pretty sure MIT was going to come down and require scores, just based on everything that they've said, how selective they are, how how much they have a core curriculum, that's core curriculum that requires so much advanced math, and they've been so public about the fact that they find scores to be valuable. So there's kind of that other group too. But what are your thoughts on that, Lisa? Well, you know, um, I think as long as people are clear about what they're going to do with it, you know, like MIT, I don't have any problem with. They're yeah, very upfront about what they're doing, and they're very upfront about why. Yeah. You know, so it makes sense. Yep. But Auburn, I think, on this one was maybe a little confusing um, for Victoria. And luckily, Victoria has, like, an amazing GPA, so I'm sure she has some lovely options other places. Um, but if she really wanted to go to Auburn, you know, that really would have made it hard for her because I'm sure she otherwise would have gotten Merit Aid there. So, you know, I – 
that was not a great outcome of the test optional movement. Not at all. No, definitely not a great outcome. But I was asking you, like, what are your thoughts on sort of like my paradigm and my grid and how oh. I look at that? that? Yeah, no, sorry. I absolutely agree uh, with that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that, <laughs> that was my fault sense. for not being clear. And I, I just want to comment that my sister-in-law is very lovely. Okay, like, good. <laughs> uh, I don't really have any trust issues with her whatsoever. <laughs> but, you know. I hit like, a little too close to home with yeah. that analogy. <laughs> no. <laughs> she probably um, doesn't listen to the podcast. Oh, no. None of my family would listen to this podcast but um <laughs> but you know i think that you're absolutely right you know and it pays to look at which kind of school it is what their history is with being test optional and like i said if it's a large public school even if they say they're not and if you have like some decent scores probably you should submit them anyway i know that the unc system just went test optional for the next admission cycle um, but who knows how long that's going to last. And I don't know how that affects, you know, all of their decision-making processes here. So now one thing, one, one question that I find is a pretty good way of sussing out and teasing it is to ask if they're test optional for all their scholarships. Right. Right. And really getting into the nuance on that, because some, some schools will be test optional for all their scholarships. Some of them, not, not at all. Some of them only for the highest ones. But that's somewhat revelatory of of um, the role test scores play. If a school is test optional and they have merit scholarships, I'm generally going to assume that having those higher test scores are going to play a role for their more generous scholarships. If they're looking at because the thing about that is they're just usually so competitive, right? And right. So when someone has really high scores versus no scores probably both candidates have a lot of the other things that they're looking for as well. So what's the ta- what, what should our takeaways be from this conversation for our listeners? I think you should ask. I think you should, you know, if there's any question at all that you should email your admissions counselor at that school and you should just ask them straight up, like, how does this work? What is, you know, what is the deal? What are the advantages and disadvantages of submitting scores? And I'm sure they will be upfront with you about that. So another thing is, um, if it's a school that's been just doing admissions by the numbers, and then they now they're saying they're they're not using scores, ask them what criteria are you using? Mm-hmm. You know, because literally it's like, for example, take let's take the the CSUs in 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 California. It's just GPA. They were already admissions by the numbers, but they had test scores in there. Now they've gone barely test blind. It's just 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 GPA. Right, right. So, but it's still worth asking those questions. I'm really sorry this had to happen, um, but I'm really grateful for the outreach to us so that to make others a little bit more cognizant. So hopefully it won't happen to too many others. And we are still in this sort of transitional world. So it's more, this kind of thing is more likely to happen now than three to five years from now. It still can happen, but I mean, the massive shift to test optional in such a short period of time out of necessity because people couldn't take the test, really just turned so many admission offices upside down and they're flying blind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Question three. Question three. This is from an anonymous question asker. Ooh. <laughs> and it Drama. Asks, this anonymous question asker asks, <laughs> are all hooks equal or do some count more than others? How can we know which ones count the most? Great question. And for those of you who maybe are new to our podcast, um, a hook is just a just one of those admissions terms for an institutional priority. Um, it is a it is a factor that if your student has that, it's we oftentimes use this term. Admission officers would put an extra thumb on the scale because you're bringing something to that community that is either very rare to find or is so invaluable to them that you become a priority applicant. Um, you you may remember, Lisa, I did a conversation, I uh, had a conversation a while ago. Um, he's written one of the better books out there on the essay. Henry Bald, author of On Writing the College Application Essay, who was a former admission officer in multiple schools, including Columbia University and Brown University. And, you know, and he basically said, he basically divides candidates up into two groups. Um, People that have a built-in lobby and just folks. Are you a just folks or do you have a built-in lobby? 
And and a hook is someone who comes in with the built-in lobby, right? And so the so the question is, no, not all hooks are, are counted equally at all. But the ones that count the most are the ones that do a few things. They either bring the school a lot of publicity or students or money. So they either bring resources into the school or publicity to the school or they significantly impact the quality of the experience for people who are already there. So I know that sounds so, you know, arcane when you put it that way, but let's look at some examples. So I think that will make it concrete. One of the big hooks is being a celebrity kid. That's a big hook. Do you think people are really going to turn down Obama's kids? No. Yeah, because of the publicity. I remember all the way back, and I'm really dating myself here, but Brooke Shields was like an actress, like a really yes, long yes. scene where she, mm -hmm. <laughs> you remember that, Lisa. And she went to Princeton. Yeah, she went to an Ivy League school. I mean, all respect to Brooke, but I don't think she might have gotten in with her <laughs> academic record alone. Well, I don't want to judge her because I never saw it. But all I know is that Princeton wanted that publicity. And here we are, like literally talking about it like 35 years later. Right, right. And so celebrities are really, really big hook. And and why? Because it gives the school a tremendous amount of publicity and that publicity leads to other people applying. Right. Being a star football player is a really big hook. You can be you literally can put our TV, our school on national TV. Like how how much for for four hours, like how many how many multi multi millions would it cost us to do that kind of advertising? So. That becomes a really, really big hook because it what it brings the school a lot of additional students, revenue, publicity, attention. So another really big one is what we call the development or the advancement at MIT. So this is the person who's you know parents can build the building. Why? Because that infusion of resources is going to help a lot of people, or maybe the you know you're setting up an endowed scholarship fund, twenty twenty five million dollars. Wow, that's going to help people in perpetuity. So in the book, The Price of Admission, Daniel Golden, he goes into how the wealthy buy their way into colleges and that kind of thing. And he breaks down some of these different hooks and estimates what, per estimates what percentage of people they are in each campus, right? And so when he talks about development, you know, and celebrity, you know, those are the low numbers, right? Really low, low single digits, like, you know, I think he has 2 to 4%, or 1 to 3%. I don't want to it's, – it's under 5%, the stack numbers. He has those numbers. So let's talk about some other things that are hooks, but they don't care as much weight. Well, I'll keep in the sports realm. Think of a student I'm working right now who's a diver. So the diver is nice, but tons of people aren't coming out to watch the diver. Diver's not getting you on national TV. And most sports actually lose money. Instead of bringing money into the admission office the way you bend, usually men's basketball and football, and depending on your school, a few other sports do, like at UConn and South Carolina, women's basketball and, you know, Denver, hockey and lacrosse, like a few a few niche schools that have really, really strong one-off sports, they can bring a little money in. But for the most, a lot of people don't know this, most sports lose money and they're carried along by men's basketball and men's football. So the sports that bring revenue in, they carry a lot. That that's It's not like athlete is an athlete. Not at all. Now, let's say this diver is going to be an Olympian. Okay, now that's going to – now, gee, we're watching the Olympics and we're going to – you know, and they're going to say, uh, you know, diver Susie Sharp who's attended Marquette University. Ooh, Marquette's loving that. So I just made that up, by the way. I don't even know if Marquette even has diving, by the way. <laughs> But they didn't mention it on my tour, but you know, who knows? <laughs> not that you were looking for diving. <laughs> no, I wasn't really focused on that. So next. By time. the way, I'm going to be there. I'll be there in July. I'm looking forward to that. I'll be at Marquette. I'm looking forward to that. But um, so so that's the biggest thing. Like, do you do you bring the school either um, a lot of publicity or revenue um, or do you significantly increase the experience for others? So, and once again, it's what I've said, like schools want what they don't have. So the easier it is to get someone, the harder it is. That's why even like if you look at racial diversity, mm -hmm. 
like men typically will have a little will have an easier path than women because they're harder to get. I Lisa's frowning <laughs> over there. She's giving me the she's giving me the feminist eye. <laughs> the feminist eye. <laughs> uh well, as Lisa has said, and you can tell me to delete this if I shouldn't, but uh include it, but so many times in your life in your counseling is hearing women who have, mm. have been passed over or whatever oh. in corporate no, America it's, or it's... their looks aren't this or whatever and like you get a steady dose of that, right? Yeah, yeah. I would say that, you know, um discrimination is real on that one. But you know, and it's hard. You know, sure. it's I have a, you know, probably going to be a high achieving son and I know it's going to be easier for him to get in places than let's say from my high achieving daughter, just on the basis of sex. And that is not exactly fair. Sure. Well, we know life isn't fair and and, and admissions never claim to be fair. It's about institutional priorities. It's about doing what's in the best interest of that institution. So, so, so if you just run these things through the grid, a person of color who's a native American that counts the most because it's the hardest to get. That will carry more weight than anything else, black male, Hispanic male. You look at Asian communities, sometimes it's a hook being Asian, sometimes it's not. When is it? For very unique Asian populations where they don't get a lot of. So, But that's not going to be a massive hook because it's not going to be like going to be bringing tons and tons of students into your school or dollars into your coffers. But it might be seen as, oh, if we have this Native American kid, Others can learn about that culture that can enhance and elevate everybody's understanding of what it's like to be Native American as you have conversations over dinner in the dorms. So it will carry some weight like alumni will carry some weight. But, you know, it's going to carry more weight if that alumni is a big donor, that alumni is like organizing all the class functions. So it's all about like, how are you uniquely impacting that institution? And if you're going to really take that institution and impact it in a substantial way, that's when your hook, or also called tags, uh, I don't hear tags as much as I used to. I used to hear the term tag like 15 years ago more than I do now, but sometimes people call hooks tags. Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna carry, it's gonna carry more weight, and it can vary from school to school, right? So obviously, if you're a big football star at one place, that could carry a lot of weight. Another place may not even have football, so it means literally nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's kind of the approach. Now, faculty kit, that can be a pretty big hook. And you might say, well, why is that such a big hook? Like, how's the faculty bringing in a ton of money? How are they attracting a lot of students? Well, try denying a faculty kid, and their resume can be on the street really fast. You know? And so do you really want to lose somebody? You lose, That's a pretty big loss if you lose a really good faculty member. And nobody's going to get into finding out, like, well, is this one good or bad? Do people like it? They're not going to take time to do all that. They're going to work off the assumption they're employed here. They must be a value. And so that's going to kind of be seen as a fairly big one. But this is also case by case because at some schools, being a faculty kid is a non-factor or a very minor hook, depending on their policy. So what are your thoughts, Lisa? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. It is so school dependent. Uh, too, because, you know, Lily, you know, is adopted from India. So sure. she's obviously Southeast Asian. Yeah. But in her application process, that was a, like kind of like maybe a limiting factor in some places. But I know Elon, where she's attending, mm-hmm. you know, they really want to increase their population of Southeast Asian students. And yep. so I knew that they would, you know, pursue her, which they did. And now they just contacted her. They want to do her to do a photo shoot mm-hmm. for the website and the sure. brochures. And, you know, and she yep. said, why are they doing this? I'm like, oh, it's payback time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they brought you there. That's why they gave you your scholarship. And now it's time to go smile for the camera. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I had a flashback to a friend. Shout out to my friend, Andy Hogue, but he's been doing great work for 20 years. And he works with... Uh, fantastic organization called New Jersey Seeds, which is, which helps um, gifted and talented under-resourced kids, like getting colleges and how they select their private schools. And, but it's race blind. It's like Questbridge. Mm -hmm. And so it's a race blind program. And the hardest kids to place are like poor white kids, you know, because he always says everybody claims they want diversity, but they really want diversity for the camera. They want the photo op. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, the poor white kid, you know, costs you financial aid and you don't get the benefit of the picture of looking at people looking at campus and saying, oh, this place is diverse. So mm-hmm. yeah, I just had right. that flashback right. when you said that. Right. But I think that so the conversation of hooks 
it it is campus dependent, but. I would say there are some ones that generally are going to consistently be big ones. Celebrity is going to be a big one. Of Development course. admit is going to be a big one. Foot uh, sports star in a revenue producing sport is going to be a big one. Generally, faculty is going to be a big one. Where you'll get a lot of variation is one you mentioned: racial diversity. First of all, you got nine states that can't even look at it at all. So those are some of the ones where there's tremendous variation from one school to the next. Unique artistic talent, like a rare talent, such as an instrument needed for the orchestra. Now that can vary based on how important the role of music is in that particular school. Interest in an unsubscribed major. Let's say the school's considering phasing out a particular major or laying off faculty in that major. Or if there's a specific institutional priority to get more women graduating in engineering or men in nursing. That can really matter at one school and be a total non-factor at another school that may not even offer those majors. Faculty kid will also vary based on their policy of that school. Honestly, being a recruited athlete is the biggest one by far in terms of the number of students that it impacts. At some schools, it's as many as one in three students are varsity athletes at certain selective liberal arts schools. And their hook may have helped as many as 20% or one in five get in. And being a recruited star athlete at a revenue producing sport in a major division, that is way up there with things like development and celebrity. For example, if you're to take a look at the top 10 ranked men's basketball players every year, look how many of them have scholarship offers from Duke. Chances are highly unlikely that if it was just academics, Duke would be offering them a spot. So it's when you're willing to go substantially out of your profile for a school priority, that's when your hook has some power. But hopefully this added a little bit of nuance on how hooks and tags work. Uh, but in general, I will just say this, um, at the most highly selective schools, not that many spots go to unhooked applicants. They just really don't. And, you know, I'll say this, you know, and Susan, Susan Tree and I used to do college counseling together at West Town. You know, we used to talk and say, you know, Mark, everybody's like going crazy over like the college list and how like amazing it is this year or whatever. But in reality, every single one of those kids that got in came in hooked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like people look at that who are unhooked and think, oh, I have a shot at getting in all these schools. Look at that. And those spots are not like it's there. And especially if you take if you take after all the hooked applicants and then you take away all the early decision admits. It's just not that many spots left at the most highly selective. And it's just something that people, I'm not trying to be negative, but it's just something that people need to be aware of. Right. Yeah. You know, Mark, I think I mentioned this to you in a text last night, but I um, watched the documentary that has come out in late 2021. It's called Try Harder. And it is fantastic. And it really displays the struggles of some very high achieving students at Lowell High School in San Francisco, which is a, you know, uh, admissions based, very high powered magnet school there. And it really kind of sheds a lot of light on you know, hooks and what gets you in and what doesn't and sort of the, in some ways, the arbitrary nature of the process. I think I rented it for $2 on YouTube, um, but it is really fantastic. And I, I, I think that's going to be something I recommend all parents to watch before they start this process. Well, not only you recommending it, but that's our recommended resource of the week. There you go. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> we got that done. I trust, I trust you in, inherently and now need to go watch it. <laughs> Well, you know, I had gotten invited by, for some reason, by my local PBS station to do a free screening of it last week, but then I oh, couldn't wow. do it because of the schedule yeah. problems. But I really did. They had all these college counselors from all over North Carolina that were going to discuss it afterwards. So oh, I was wow. really sad to not be able to yeah. go. But um, so I still wanted to watch it and it did not disappoint. It was really fantastic. If you ever get a chance to do one of those, I've done one of those where there's like this screening Mm -hmm. And they invite the college counselors in for the conversation afterward. They're, they're really good. Right. They're, really, they're right. pretty awesome. All right. Well, that's that's fantastic. Awesome. Anything else you want to add to the hooks conversation? 
No, good luck, everybody. <laughs> it's hard, you know. Um, you know, if you're just a really great kid and you don't, you're not donating a building and you're not a football star. I mean, it's a little discouraging, but there is going to be a different school, but a great school there for you. And well, here's what I will say: a lot of times, you actually can sometimes create a hook for yourself. You're not going to be able to create one of these like massive ones that have a lot of weight, but one of them can be your interests. Like uh, one of the students I'm working with now, um, just her majors that she's interested in, they're very unique for someone that wants to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And it's not a major thing, but it's a, you can do things that add to your interesting factor, which is not quite the same as a hook. But the more interesting you are, the more you can sizzle and more you can stand up. But once again, this is all talk about highly selective schools. There's I can't emphasize enough overwhelming majority of students um, schools are not highly selective and the students that I worked with this year that like did not have high grades, they did amazingly well. They got in so many schools. They just applied to the right schools, you know? And so I have to, I feel I need to say that because one of the things that happens so much in the media is there's so much conversation all the time about these highly selectives and that's intentional because it get it's clickbait. Yeah. You will like one of the things you have to do as an author is you have to get your articles read. And so you know that if you run an article on Stanford, you get more clicks than if you run one on Samford, which is a school in Alabama, S A M F O R D. So you set out and you write the article on Stanford, not Samford, and you get 10 times more people that click it. Yes. Yes. So it creates this perception that it's almost impossible to get in when you're literally talking about a very, very small number of schools. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But I do know from all of our letters that we do have quite a few listeners that are looking at a lot of those schools, so I don't want to neglect that sector mm -hmm. either. Oh, well, well, hopefully that was helpful, anonymous listener. Thank you. Thank you, anonymous <laughs> listener. <laughs> <laughs> and now this week's interview with a special guest. All right, friends, hopefully you enjoyed the first part of my interview with Chris Gruber. Uh, love Chris's transparency as he talks about how Davidson took the pandemic as a time to reflect back and look at their own biases and see how they could be more student friendly. So in part two, Chris talks about some school wide initiatives that Davidson made. He shares how they learned to read a file without test scores. What was that like? Was it easy? Was it hard? What changes did they have to make? He talks about looking at the length of their application and changes they made there. And then I put Chris on the hot seat. And like the pro he is, he never flinched and answered every question I said without a hitch. Listen and enjoy. This is something that's been on my mind a lot lately. All highly selective private schools, for the most part, like to tout their diversity. And, and in some ways they have a lot of diverse. There's a lot of, they can point to the number of states, they can point to a uh, number of countries, you know, they can sometimes point to thought diversity, but social class diversity is actually really, really important. Or you get into homogenous social class group think. And when you see the, you know, really low Pell Grant numbers and not that Pell is the be all and end all, um, but if a school is 7% Pell, can they really claim to be diverse? On that spectrum, yeah, no, um, no, you, 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 you can't. Um, and, and again, um, you know, Mark, in, in, in your tenure as, as, as a Davidson parent, and, and that never ends, just so you know, <laughs> uh, but you've probably heard Carol Quone, our president, speak of that. Yeah. And, and that is that true learning takes place when you are surrounded by different people and different comes in so many different ways. This is a time in one's life whereby they are probably going to have the greatest opportunity to be surrounded by students of difference. It doesn't happen once you typically are working. It doesn't happen in your neighborhood. It doesn't happen with typically with your faith tradition. You know, you, you, you hang towards those that are very much like you. Um, so I do think this is an important thing. Um, Carol Quone has been, you know, one of the early leaders with ATI and their work. Um, in this to say, let's continuously look to grow this. Um, Pell alone, I don't think is alone 
is something you, you, you missed by a dollar and, and guess what? Sure, sure. You missed, um, and it, that's that's a that's a hard figure. Um, that's a real hard figure to do. I think there are other things that we could add to it. Could it be including first generation? Could be a pet percentage sure. of cost. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of ways that you can be looking at that. I also appreciate that the means for some schools, some don't have the ability to support. Um, there are few schools in this country that are resourced um, in ways that give them that type of privilege sure. in being able to enroll anyone that they truly, truly want. Um, but you're right. I think that social um, understanding of where families are coming from is, is, is a big one. And it also requires that we have that understanding as well so that when the student gets on campus, uh, they're not going without in terms of having the true experience they need to have while they're here. Uh, hey, everybody's going out to this concert on campus tonight. Well, I am not. Well, yes, you are because the concert is free. Um, you know, we those are things that need be done or putting things in place and campus being open at different breaks because the fact that students don't have the ability or let's create a program where more can be going home with a friend who lives nearby. Um, you know, we've done some of those things for international students. Davidson should become, I mean, the, obviously the commitment to no loans is a strong commitment in that direction that very few schools do. And it's a huge commitment to, to reach that uh, social class diversity without burdensome loans. You guys are, you probably, I'm sure you know this, you ask for less in a summer work component than most of the Ivy League schools. Uh, once again, not everybody can make 3000 over the summer after not make 3000, take 3000 home after taxes that you don't spend for anything at all over the summer. And Mark, think of where that's gone in the last couple of years too. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, who had, who had that job? You know, there's some that did, there's some that yeah. did, but that's increasingly harder. And then you add to that, what are we looking for students to do in their summer months? Sure. You know, what are employers, what are grad schools looking for folks to do in their summer months? You know, what experiences have you had that are going to be preparing you for that next step? Boy, I'd love to have the internship, but the internship doesn't pay. So, you know, that's where, again, I think we've worked with a diligence to make things affordable, to have those internships, externships that can be, you know, giving students that so deserved experience, but also uh, to help them with this at the end. Sure. You know, I have to share, I had this great diversity story that I share now with people about the value of diversity from my own life. So when I wrote my book, um, 171 Answers, originally the cover was going to was gonna be kids with their hands up, like in class, like, you know, you a bunch of hands up. Yeah. And there's just some stock photography, you know, you get of all that. And I was going to make it the cover. I was like 99% sure. And I, and I said, you know, I had assembled a little bit of a think tank group of six people that I bounce ideas off of. And so there were three women, three guys on the group. I shot I shot the cover off to people. And interesting, all three of the women said, if you're going to go with that, you should change those hands. Those are all dude hands. There's no bracelets. There's no nail polish. Look at the fingernails. And I didn't see it. And none of the guys saw it. All three of the women saw it. And this wasn't like a group around a table kind of thing. I did it in a way where everybody individually emailed me so it wouldn't be this group thing. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Independently, all three of the women saw it and none of the four guys counting me saw it. And that is such an example of like what happens when you have voices that are not around the table. I like to share that with people. Agreed, agreed. Um, you know, isn't it funny how it was, I was, we were talking about this earlier before we began, and you know that I was, I spent, you know, time in Montana this past yeah, summer, so you know, hiking, that. and, yep. you know, there's, there's so many ways in which you can do this, you know, you can say, I want to get from point A to point B, and let's do it, let's do it fast. Um, I had to, to poke along because I wanted to start, I wanted to stop and look. And here we could be at different vantage points. And, you know, the beauty of doing this with, you know, family and beautiful friends was we saw different things. And then what are you able to do? It's the exact thing that you were able to do, Mark, in your example. They were able to share what they were seeing. And the benefit is now look at everything we've been able to see. Um, and 
there's real value in that. That's what the real learning can come in in places like ours and places that, you know, you in Atlanta work for and those students. Sure. Talk to me about test optional a little more. You know, we've had so many people come on and talk about why they went test optional. I haven't had many people say, what was it like? What was the change like for you as a reader? Uh, what did you learn? And I know you're part of a three-year experiment, so I'm still, I think that was smart to look at it more than just one year. Probably learn more in year two, year three. Uh, but what can you tell us that you learned from being test optional for the first time and making decisions without scores versus with them? We learned that it took us longer to get through <laughs> because of the fact that what it did is it placed greater emphasis on the other parts of the application in order for us to find strength. And I'm being very intentional in my words here. Uh, my All of my kids at one point in their life worked for the Life is Good uh, clothing, that brand. And one of my favorite shirts that I've got, it shows a picture of a beverage on the front. It's just a beverage. It's not an alcoholic beverage, Mark, so I don't want you to make any assumptions about what I would be <laughs> drinking. <laughs> uh, but the glass, has, what it says under it is, is half full, half full. And what we were looking to do is find what are ways that we can find strength in a student now that one of those modalities happens to be gone. And what we also want to do is make no assumption as to why that student does not have a test score here. Let's be honest, in this first year, there were a lot of students who test optional really was no option. I didn't have a test. I couldn't get it. And what we did find is those that did have it, it was often coming by way of a place of privilege or an early test, but it was coming because some schools facilitated that type sure. of a process and, and, and made it available to them. But what did we find? You know, we found that we were spending more time talking about program and understanding program in terms of what a student has taken and how they've grown over that four years, the type of challenge that they had, were there trend lines? Um, we wanted to have an understanding as to how that student was being taught and how they were learning. Were they in a remote environment? What was the blend? What did those grades mean? Did the grades that they earned at the end of their junior year, were those grades frozen and a student could only go up from that time? So we, a lot of context. Do, do you find you're looking to see how much grade inflation this school has? I mean, I'm sure you're already doing that, but I would think when going test optional, that even puts more of a premium. Is this a school where 80% of kids get A's? Yeah, well, yeah, you know, we're, we, there's not a lot of C's in many places anymore. Um, <laughs> some people get fired for C's at certain private schools or, or called into meetings and some harsh warnings. Yeah, you know, and, and hence what you have at a large number of schools today, Mark, is schools moving away from the sharing of that information. Because if we were to be sharing a grade distribution, 75% of the grades would be between an A plus and an A minus. Um, so what does that make that be? So yeah, we are looking, but again, how do we, if we've got a significant enough sample, we might be able to understand that. But you know, in, in this past year's class, you know, 500 and, you know, 540 some odd students that enrolled from almost 460 different schools. So understanding grade inflation in a statistical way, that's difficult to do unless we are given information. And a lot of schools don't want to give us that much, um, you know, on that. But we're appreciating. A, A is a grade that most schools are, are sharing with a large, large percentage of their students. And that is something that, that is assumed. Um, it's assumed until it's proven otherwise. And maybe that's the way to do it. And a school needs to say, hey, the top of the class has a B plus, well, then then share, then share. We're going to need to see more. But it, it, it took us greater time. We were looking for greater strength. We were looking at the transcript. We were looking at um, the narratives of what a student shared. We were looking more at profile. We were looking at teacher recommendations and trying to find those hidden nuggets um, that talked also about and, and brace yourself, you know, what what type of a community member was this through a very, very trying time? I, I believe that students and those that have come back to school right now have been starved to get back to a community. They're starved to get back to a real community. And I think most of them, most of them, it's not pure, 
most of them are are ready, able, and willing to do all of the things needed in order to keep this community whole, healthy, and and moving forward. So what were those students doing during this pandemic? Were they complaining about these Zoom meetings are just awful and I hate these class discussions and I hate these breakouts? Or were they saying, you know, Mr. Stucker, that was a really great session that you offered today. And boy, that was a tough topic for you to be addressing by way of a Zoom meeting. But you did a really nice job and I got some great nuggets to take away from that. There's the type of thing that was coming about in conversation and those that were working in a sincere, genuine way and finding those things within some of the letters of recommendation that pointed to, let's keep looking at this one. I, I, I like the spirit of what they could be bringing. Did, did you feel a degree of confidence that you're pretty confident without the scores that you had enough tools in the bag to pick people that could both do well academically and be community contributors? Or do you feel like Hey, we're flying blind here and we'll find out in a couple of years when we go back and look at the data. Yes. <laughs> that means both, both hands. Uh, yeah, I, both come hands. on, Mark. I think there's an element of both that, you know, sure. that would rest in there. Um, these students that have come through this process are, you know, beautiful first year students four weeks into their journey and, and time will tell us some things. Um, what we focus on in life, I think, way too often is going to be the things that went awry. 99 people could say, Mark, I loved your podcast. And sometimes you may fixate on that one response that you got that said, you didn't cover this. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You know, well, we get those. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, but isn't that what we get in life? Sure. And what I what I have a confidence in is that in areas whereby we admitted every student for a reason. We admitted every student for a reason and multiple reasons. If by chance the absence of that test score could have been something that may have helped us or pointed to something, um, we might learn a few of those along the way. What I have a confidence in thinking is, is that the N, the sample, is going to be low. And I think part of that is also the community that they've come into. And if we saw enough things right to say our glass is half full, let's admit that student. I think they're going to be okay. That's what allows us to sleep at night. There you go. There you go. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, I'm sure you recall Lisa and I talking and and me saying that try harder documentary, that's going to be our recommended resource. Well, I went home that night watched, bought the documentary, and just rent it, bought it. I don't want to tell you what time I watched it because you'll be, like, mad at me for not getting my sleep in. (laughs) But I'll just say I ended at 4 a.m. How's that? (laughs) (laughs) So I I watched it, and I got so into it that I went and watched another hour um, conversation with the producer on YouTube. It was so powerful. So, Lisa, why don't you share why you feel this is so powerful and why we're both recommending it? I just came out of a session before we record it now, where I told a student I want them to watch this with their family, I recommended it yesterday. Uh, what was it that grabbed you? Well, I first learned of it from um, PBS, um, North Carolina PBS, which I love, and they are going to start. Sh- they're going to show this as part of their independent lens series where they show independent documentaries but they had a special screening and I don't know how they picked me but they offered that I could go to the screening and they had all these different college counselors and I really wanted to do it but then I had this like big you know conflict so I couldn't so I was very curious about it so I rented it and I was transfixed Mm -hmm. because I I felt like what these kids at Lowell High School were going through was what kind of all kids in America are going through. And I just thought it was so dramatic. I thought like the psychology of it, you know, how the the kids' expectations throughout the process changed over time was really fascinating. I I think it's just anyone who's applying to college should watch this movie and their parents. Yeah, anyone and their their parents. And and especially, (laughs) especially if you aspire to go to a highly selective school, And especially if you are in a school where there's a lot of pressure and a lot of pressure to go to a highly selective school. Or even if it's just in your peer group, it doesn't even have to be the whole school. Because the documentary 
it it looks at it really traces the life of these five students. Um, but you get a sense of the whole school at this top ranked uh, public, very diverse school in San Francisco. And it shows the absolute incredible pressure that these kids feel to have to go to, as one person says throughout the documentary, a top 20 school. Uh, they're obsessed with Stanford, you know, and Berkeley and, and other schools and Ivy's. And you see the psychological toll that it takes on their kids. Like a lot of ways it was really sad. Yes, uh, it really I mean, was. it is moving, but it was really, really sad that this is what we're doing to our kids. Did you have the same thought, Lisa? Absolutely. You know, and I, I know I, we're going to talk about this more um, mm -hmm. in a future, um, future podcast, but like this kind of pressure has been building and building and building on teenagers and their mental health has been getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And I hope that people, when they watch these kids go through this process in that pressure cooker of a school with parents who don't really understand what they're asking other kids, they, I hope they will understand more what kind of negative effects that has on kids. I mean, there was like only one parent that I saw in that documentary who said, I always let my son do what he wanted. I didn't push him. And that kid was the only one who was like well-adjusted and happy yeah. through most yeah. of the documentary, honestly. Yeah. In some ways, I almost think it's more important that parents watch this than kids. Yeah. Yeah. Because kids live it. They know it. Yeah, because parents can you can create an environment that shelters kids from some of this by how you by how you play your cards. You know, you're you're the manager. You're navigating the ship. Mm -hmm. And so um, just just watch it. It's an hour, and 25 minutes. Uh, it's either two ninety nine on YouTube to rent or you can buy it for nine ninety nine. I, I could tell right away. I watched the trailer and. Lisa's like, Mark, you need to watch this. She doesn't do that very often. So I knew based on her <laughs> strong recommendation, I'm like, I'm buying it because it's something I'm going to watch over and over and I'm going to show it to people when they come to our house. Yeah. No, I think that um, I just can't speak highly enough of this documentary. And the kids were wonderful. And the parents, they gave so much access. They're, they were so honest. Um, and there's just some really heartbreaking moments in it. Um, so, you know. But most people, you know, I won't I won't spoil the ending, but yeah. And and we don't normally do a five minute recommended resource, but I think that's how important this is. And Lisa and I are following up this next week in our question for a, a listener segment where we're going to pick up on this topic again. So. All right, friends, we'll now return to the final part of my interview with Chris Gruber. Well, I certainly get the overwhelming sense from the majority of the people that are at highly selective schools like you that went test optional, that they're overall pretty optimistic um, um, about the extra applicants it puts in your pool and um, think that you are going to be able to make those decisions. Like, sure, like anything, it's going to get better as you refine your systems in year one, year two, year three. Uh, but but I think that it, I don't see, uh, oh, my goodness, we are, we're doomed. You're like, this is we're just throwing blind darts. Well, because we also know what test scores are, and test scores are highly tied to the zip codes that one comes from, um, and, and and that's something that's been known for a long, long time. Um, so, um, and test optional is not something new. Some of the finest schools in sure. this country have done, you know, sure. our, our good friends at Bowdoin in Brunswick, 50 Maine. 50 years for Bowdoin now. 50 years that they have yeah. done it. So, Claudia, yeah. there you go. I just plugged you. Um, They've done it a long time, and, and, and others have done it. And schools have done it for good reason. Schools have done it for good reason. And maybe some have done it from a marketing standpoint. Let's just stop for a sec there, because just so our listeners know what Chris is talking about, research does indicate when you go test optional, you're most likely to get more applicants, right? And, and your average test scores are likely to go up because those who are going to submit are going to be higher testers. So your numbers look better and you get more applicants. And so that's... That's uh, primarily what you're referring to there when you say the marketing side, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But folks who sit in my position, we're looking at students that are going to be able to come to our campus and they're going to be able to succeed. That's what we want. That's what we want. I don't want to have to replace a student. 
I want them to come. I want them to have a great, vibrant four-year experience. Um, so the schools that had made these moves prior to when you know we did, and 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 I'm sure. glad we made it early in March of 20. Maybe they were they were they were just smarter than us. <laughs> well, you know, so I, I was thinking about another North Carolina school, Wake Forest. I think they maybe 07. I know they made it before I moved here in 09 because I remember talking with their director when I was still back at Westtown School. And I, I thought about them when you you said needing more time because I explain people are like boy this Wake Forest application is a bear, and I I explain well that happened when they went test optional they felt they needed a little more info. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and and this of what we spoke about earlier, Mark, this conversation of um, I remember a colleague I, I won't mention name of person um, and sure. place, uh, sure. but I remember there was one year where they were thinking, boy, we'd love to have more information about a student. We'd love to have more information. And as a result, I think they asked four or five additional questions that required students to write, um, you know, short little narratives. <laughs> the following year, their applications tanked. Um, yeah. Those questions were short-lived and they were, and I mean, they were gone. that's got to be a hard decision for schools. Uh, you know, I know Wash U recently, They're, they've said this publicly, so I can say their name. Uh, they they added they added some questions a few years ago and saw an 18 percent drop in in certain markets with adding some questions and so there's always that balance people are getting right do we want people to have pre-screened us a little bit and went on the front end and they ask more questions or do we want to leave it wide open and get them into our pool and then uh maybe you know um we'll wow them in and getting that balance is, is tricky there's a balance that you want to hit there as well. Um, I don't want students applying to Davidson blindly without knowing this is the place that you would be. I want you to know what you're getting yourself into. Sure. What's going to be expected? What, you know, what do we pride ourselves on? You got to know those things. You should know yeah. those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as a result, if you've got to have some skin in the game in order to be completing an application, but it's that balance is what I talked about before. And that is, you know, don't ask questions if you're not going to be using it. It's going to be helping you in some type of an evaluative process for deciding who are going to be the best students for your school um, in, in so many ways. Sure. Anything we haven't touched on yet, uh, Chris, when you went back and looked at your systems, we've talked about moving deadlines, a few different deadlines, regular decision deadline, ED2 deadline. Uh, we've talked about changing a few questions, modifying a few questions, uh, talked about not necessarily making the inferences from a college profile that may have a lower percentage of uh, kids that went on to four-year schools. Um, anything that we haven't touched on that you're either implementing or closely scrutinizing, or do you think we covered it all? Mark, I think we've covered it. Um... And I think there's going to be more to come. There's going to be some untold stories of the things that we're able to, uh, you know, what, what will be on that list, uh, that grocery list of things that we have done when all is said and done. And, and most importantly, um, would have made some impact on, on what we have done as well, um, you know, from the, from the recruitment side, from a deadline date, from an application completeness rate, um, and then to see who are these scholars in the years to come. So um, well, those are the exciting things. Fantastic. We get multiple chances. So that's a good thing. Yeah, this has been fantastic. And uh, we have a, a policy at, at your Cosbound Kid. No first time guests gets away without going on the hot seat. So, uh, oh, boy, here we go. Hot seat. <laughs> non, non, mostly non-college stuff. All right. Favorite place you've ever traveled to and visited? Oh, that's simple. That is simple. Uh, Paris. Oh, what was it about Paris that, that made it pop? To be honest with you, it um, it was a place I visited when my son had been there for about a six month period of time, um, and to learn it by way of his lens, um, by way of his voice and his spoken word. <laughs> they speak French there, <laughs> there <you go. laughs> um, but it, it, it was it was just a place that I always dreamed about getting to, um, and had never been, um, and all those different sites and places and museums and. Simply fantastic. Loved it. Awesome. What What's that guilty pleasure food that you shouldn't eat because it's not healthy, but you can't help yourself and, and you eat more of it than you probably should? I-C-E-C-R-E-A-M. <laughs> what's, the, what's the flavor? 
No bowl <laughs> needed. Anything that has a chocolate chip in it, peanut butter, and if you want to blend some type of caramel or coffee in there, home run. That is an absolute home run. Mm -hmm. There you go. Favorite TV show? Oh, boy. I, I've had more TV watching time in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, these you talk about guilty pleasures. Sure. Um, I, I will tell you the one that on the it's been Friday nights. It's been um, Ted Lasso um, has been one that we have been taking in a right as it comes out, right as it comes out. Um, so that's that's a one right now. And I like it for so, so many different reasons. Good stuff. Favorite sport? Ice hockey. Hands oh, down. Grew wow. up in, Is that some Philly roots? Absolutely. Absolutely. Was there in 75 and 76. Went to the parades. Absolutely. Um, oh, so, wow. yeah. Um, there was a guy who... Um, my father had been the friends of one of the oral surgeons. He was one of my dad's customers. Um, and the night that I had my wisdom teeth taken out is a night that Bobby yeah. Clark lost some teeth and came to the hospital. I got to meet him that night in the hospital. So wow. there's a lot of things for your viewers. Who is Bobby Clark? Number 16 <laughs> from the Philadelphia Flyers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you brought back memories to me because I remember that that team. They, they had the guys that used to fight a lot and throw punches and all that. Schultz and Kelly. Yeah. Schultz yeah. and Kelly. Yeah. Yep. Um, showing our age. I, I know. I know. And that also meant that when we had wisdom teeth taken out, then we were in the hospital for the night. Um, yeah. <laughs> See how old I am. There you go. Best Broadway play you've ever seen. Oh, um, there's one that I would like to see. I think you could guess which that one Hamilton? is. Yeah. Um, Weren't they coming to Charlotte? They are here. They're coming they yeah, are. They're here. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they have been. Um, one that I just so enjoyed because it was my daughter's favorite and I'd heard everything before I got there, but I so enjoyed was uh, Jersey Boys and saw that just before she went off to college. Good stuff. A book you've read that's had a big impact on you in the last few years. I knew you were going to talk about this. So you were ready for me. I knew you were going to talk about that. And it's one I actually just finished and there's going to get a Davidson plug that comes with it. There it is. It's Clint Smith's um, How the Word is Passed. And I think he just he's just done a beautiful job in talking about um, you know, slavery in this country um, and how this narrative history has and has not been told. Eye opening. All right. Last question. Your your best. Well, it's really two, but your best advice for students. I'm going to give you three because you're oh, You you're keep changing the number. Feet. What's the deal I here? Know. Come on. You're a professional interviewer. What are you doing? <laughs> Being unprofessional. <laughs> Best advice to students, parents, and college counselors. Yeah. Um, I think for students, one is going to be um, appreciate that you have more control of this process than you ever think. Um, you do. There's so much of it that you can shape. Um, do things early, do things in a timely fashion, and you're going to do very, very well. I know that there's not just one place. I think there are a variety of places that you can go to. Um, treat it as though it's almost an additional course. Spend some good, good time on it. Um, because I think where you spend your next four years can be a powerful, powerful thing for you. Um, so there's one. To the parents, uh, I think students feel a lot of pressure in this process. So the greatest thing to do is tell your students right now before they're starting the college search process that you're proud of them. And it will have nothing to do with the label that you put on the back of the car, or the sticker, or the sweatshirt, or the hat that you ultimately That's end up wearing advice. down the road. You're proud now, and it doesn't have to do with where they're getting into college. Um, and, and, and with counselors, um, it's always going to be, know that we're in this together. Um, we are we are partners we are colleagues and we are here to serve and i know that there's a lot of places that you need to be managing and understanding but let us know how we can help you we're ready to do it at any any step of the game this has been fantastic chris for for the person that's listening and they're thinking uh i i like that uh davidson college i like how that sounds uh what are they uh what social media do you recommend? What, how do you recommend, you know, share the website and where do you, besides the website, what would you recommend they do and go to really understand Davidson? Yeah. I'd encourage you to attend our programs. 
and we do a lot of things that are online as well as right here in Davidson, North Carolina. So I would encourage you to do attend and follow those things on social media that really highlight our students. Davidsonians are kind, they are smart, they are driven young men and women. Um, and so much of what you really want to be focusing on is going to be where you're going to be spending your next four years and with who are you going to be spending those next four years. Don't just talk about attributes of the place. Don't just understand size and program and location. Understand who you're going to be spending your time with. And I think that those students that you'll be with, that you'll learn with, that you'll collaborate with, uh, that you'll be challenged by and stretched by, that's the best part. That's, that's the seller. Chris, this has been awesome. I, I really appreciate it. I'd love to kind of do a deeper Why Davidson di deeper dive with you at some point, but we'll, we'll talk about that offline if you're open for that. We can do that. We can awesome. do that. All right. And I can bring in my entire team, Mark, and do that. We can have you come to a staff meeting. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, my daughter will forever be grateful. And I was thinking about she has lifetime friends from her Davidson experience. And I've been around them. My wife's been around them. These are good people. So you're doing a lot of good work. Keep it up. Thank you. And I will pass that on to this group of 30 that I get to work with. So thank you. Take care. And now it's time for our College Spotlight of the Week. Are pretty much these universities in English? It's something they've definitely moved towards. So again, it, it's kind of a, a trend we've seen across Europe and the Dutch defy it in a lot of ways. If you're looking to study Dutch literature, it's going to be taught in Dutch. Um, a lot of history courses outside of perhaps a global history course or a global history degree, excuse me, are going to be taught in Dutch. Um, but certainly the sciences and certainly business there's going to be heavy English components now. So is this within the same university? Within the same university, there's d different language spoken in the courses? or is Absolutely. It oh, wow. Within the same university. Interesting. So, but it sounds like, because obviously you're speaking mostly to English speakers who don't know, who, you know, who don't know Dutch. So it sounds like there's still ample offerings in English. I'm hearing you say that. Right. The, again, outside of the UK, Ireland, um, other Anglosphere countries, the Dutch have probably done the best job of putting a large number of degrees out there that are taught fully in English. Okay. So you've already given a number of reasons why somebody may consider um, a Dutch university. One is their cost can be a very cost effective option. Another is there are a number of world leading universities that are maybe not as competitive to get into as some of the other world leading universities in some of the other parts of the world. And then the third one is there's a lot of English instruction. Um, any other reasons that would make somebody choose to, to want to go to a Dutch university? I think to circle back to it, the cost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's you know, one of the big selling points that I like to bring up is for a lot of or a lot of states in state tuition without financial aid here in the US is more expensive than degrees in London or Edinburgh or wherever. That's even more pronounced in the Netherlands because of the lower cost. Now, I'm obviously quite biased towards all things international education, but in the interest of fairness, you know, there there are some reasons to maybe not consider the Netherlands. Good, I appreciate it. I was trying to jump both sides of the story. So what, what, are, what are the, the concerns, flags, things people need to be aware of? I think that the biggest thing, and again, the Dutch universities have been doing a great job of changing this, but it's still an issue compared to certainly what you see here in the U.S. and definitely what you see in Ireland or the United Kingdom, is that student life is a bit more laissez-faire. So... Housing is something that in some cases you're going to be expected to sort out on your own. Mm -hmm. um, meal plans are going to be something you're, are, frankly, feeding yourself is something you're going to be expected to sort out on your own. So it's definitely something for a student who has a bit more of an independent streak. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's, it sounds like it's going to require a level of maturity. A lot like going to Northeastern in their co-op program, because that's the way that is there as well. You got to you got to be able to figure that piece out, whether they start you out overseas and then you in or in you bound or you're 
or you're doing a, a co-op in Seattle. Like, you know, you're usually on your own to figure out the whole housing and food thing and everything. So it's definitely something that, you know, that sticks out to me. Also, while these are top global universities, simply by the fact that they're not as well known as Cambridge, Oxford, St. Andrews, LSE, which is a shame, to be quite honest with you, because in some fields, these are just as good as those. So the trade-off of that is if you're going to come back to the United States, you definitely want to go someplace where there's a definite network already here in the U.S. And that's there to varying degrees. Now, with every good or with every bad side, there's also a, a more positive way of looking at it. The Dutch have one of the most friendly ways of going from student to permanent resident to citizen. Okay. So if you're looking for a way to leave the United States for a few years, get some international work experience, and then maybe come back to the U.S. when you've built up your network or when you think you've got a compelling story for your personal statement at a top business school or whatever your plans are, the Dutch are going to help you find a way to stick around and get there. And even if you don't end up learning Dutch, because so much of the population speaks English and because it is still an EU state, you've got the ability to move around and find a job that doesn't necessarily require you to speak the language. And that's something that's quite unique in that if you look at other places, you know, it might be possible in Copenhagen or Berlin or Stockholm to get by without speaking Danish or German or Swedish. But in the Netherlands, it's infinitely easier. Now, I still, if you're going to go live someplace for three or four years, be able to carry on a conversation, you know, be, be able to know that, you know, you can't just glide by. But if you're worried about becoming professionally proficient in a language, if that's not your thing, then you shouldn't rule out the Netherlands just because of the Dutch language. So it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is it would be legitimate to ask how would the U.S. perceive my degree if you're looking at coming back, not necessarily going into grad schools, because, you know, it's the job of grad schools to know all of these international schools and their programs and all of that. I, I'm sure it would be pretty easy to go from from a Dutch uh, undergrad to a, to a U.S. grad school because, you know what I mean, they take students from uh, bigger ones from like 170 countries and things. Um, but if you're looking at coming back into the workforce, one, people may not, there may not be any name recognition. Two, the whole job placement, you've sort of been out of the U.S. system and the U.S. network of of working with their career center, like the U.S. career centers are going to have connections in the U.S. locales. And so some of that piece might be a little bit more um, complicated. Right. Um, again, there's a lot of multinational corporations that actively recruit from these universities. So if you're looking at going to an investment bank or a top consulting firm or something like that, Deloitte or Accenture or Morgan Stanley, um, they're okay if you've got a Dutch university degree and you can come back to the U.S. And that's something that's a bit beyond my pay grade to to predict this the future four or five years from now with but certainly if you're looking at coming back and working in a small town or something like that that's something worth considering but again you can very easily look up on linkedin or something like that graduates of this university that live in this country and see if there's a decent network mm -hmm. well, this is great this is awesome and I'm assuming they come in all sizes as well. Right. So you're not going to find the, the very small, like three or 4,000 student. But if you don't want the mega university filling, then you can certainly go someplace that's a bit more like the University of Virginia or, or something like that around that 15,000 student mark. Mm -hmm. and, and is the admission process pretty much the same for, for all of them? Just some may have higher expectations when it comes to, to scores and things like that, or, or are there some differences? The big differences are going to be between the WO and HBO programs, but also if you're looking at something like engineering or medicine, those are going to be more stringent. And simply because, like I said, you know, you've only got so many spots and 
in a lot of cases, there are quotas for EU residents versus non or EU citizens versus non EU citizens when they're that competitive. But for the rest of it, it's very much if you meet the academic requirements, you're in. Cool, cool. Well, listen, Kevin, you may remember this. I said when you came on the first time that you were the only first time guest ever to escape the hot seat, but I'd get you on another round. I've been waiting for it. So I'm re- well, okay, well, here we go. What What's on your bucket list? What's one thing you want to accomplish uh, before you leave this earth? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I'd love to finish this up my PhD. This is always the hardest part. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I hear you. Have you started? So this is actually something we should probably um, have a discussion <laughs> about sometime. Okay. Okay. Something that's becoming common in the UK and Australia is a PhD by publication. So it's for mid-career professionals who have published a lot in academic or trade journals and think, hey, I shouldn't have to take three or four years to go write a book or a thesis because I've already written half a dozen articles that I can coalesce together. So that's something that I'm looking at doing. Um, you know, cool. the, the problem is my wife loves Dallas, so I don't think that I, <laughs> and it, it, I don't know how it would look for business if I got a PhD someplace that wasn't abroad. So I've already started You're the trend. Fine. I need to go abroad. There you go. Love it. What is a pet peeve you have when you're driving? Actually, I just got into it with one of my best friends about this the other day. People who unnecessarily back into parking spots. <laughs> what do you mean unnecessarily? <laughs> so if it's Black Friday and yeah. you're trying to get in to get that 78 or 75 inch TV or whatever, and right. I'm being right. hyperbolistic here or, sure. or sure. more often than not, you know, I, mm-hmm. I'm trying to make it to the grocery store before I have to be somewhere. And there's mm-hmm. somebody who's sitting there waiting for a parking spot, which I get. Right. And then rather than just swoop on in when there's five cars behind them, they back up and it takes them two or three attempts to back the parking spot in. <laughs> if you can do it once, we're cool. Okay. I just roll my eyes. But if it's taking you four or five times, and the irony here is I am horrible at backing into parking spots. There you go. So it's just kind of like if I'm going to be considerate and agree not to do this, you need to be considerate and agree not to. Or go, go get you some traffic cones and practice in a high school parking lot. <laughs> Oh, you're funny. I'm a backer in her. But I don't like it when I try to back in and somebody whips in there and, and, and while I'm trying to get in and grabs my spot, which has happened. Before. You know, it's probably a good thing that we're a good thousand miles away from each yeah, other. Yeah, we might have some tension. It's all good. How do you relax? How do you unwind? How do you chill? This is actually a big joke with my friends. Um, like I said, my, my wife's um, a law student in Dallas, comes from a, a big family that does SEC football every Saturday. Sure. So for Saturdays in the fall, she is parked out in front of the TV. There are snacks. You know, we both love to cook. So it's, um, I guess, cooking is the cop-out answer. But if you really want to know, anytime there's sports on, with the exception of, of tennis, golf, um and occasionally hockey, I am in the other room with some sort of like, um, my, my favorite last year was Gombrich's The Story of Art. I am I am zoned out. I have some sort of just big, gigantic tome in my hands. And, you know, I am, I am that pretentious guy. Um, just out, put a book in your put hand. Put a book in my hand, put you a, know. If a research abstract or something. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not quite that far out, but don't okay. give me any ideas, but it, either that or cooking. So um, cool. my mom's a pastry chef, which is why I lost oh. weight when I went to college. Um, oh, wow. That's pretty awesome. Uh, well, my, my wife's a very gifted cook as well. So, you know, that quickly reversed. But, um, you know, like this this evening, I'll be I've got five different pizza doughs in the rotation. Whoa. And there'll be one going in the fridge for a four day fermentation process. So, um, look at you. You're the real deal. It, I, I am a huge nerd when it comes to food. All right. I got a food question for you then. What, what, what's your best dish? <sighs> okay. Um, that's a tough one. Cause there's so many of them. 
There's got five pizza recipes. <laughs> I'm, this is going to start some fights. Um, this is going I'm to a thousand miles away. <laughs> oh, maybe not with you. This is, this may cause some. I, I may turn off some of the listeners out there. Oh, it's okay. Good. I have mad love for all types of pizza. I I, <laughs> I have never met a piece of pizza that I didn't mind. Or I didn't like. I don't care if it is a frozen pizza or if it is the best pizza from from Rome or Naples on the face of the planet. I love making Chicago deep dish pizza. There's just, there you go. It, it's, I know that there are people out there who are going to say that's pizza casserole. And I respect that opinion. Um, I'm not going to delve into what kind of pizza is better. All I'm going to say is my favorite to make is that now a close runner up is probably Korean fried chicken. Um, I had a lot of, Korean American fraternity brothers in, in college and they got me turned on to it. And I, um, Jay Kenji Lopez Alt's book, the food lab has, I think he's got a recipe for it. I know I got the recipe from him and it's just, it, it's that ability to combine nerdiness with food that, cool. um, either, either the Chicago deep dish pizza or the, uh, Korean fried chicken. Those, those two kind of stand out. They're both great. I'm a pizza person too, but I, but I'm a little bit of a pizza snob. Like uh, I I tend to like the local places more so than the chains. And uh, but a good a very good pizza. Oh boy, that's 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 some good stuff right there. Yeah, we're we're, we're in agreement. We're in agreement. All right, what is your best advice for a parent listening, and your best advice for a student listening? That's a tough one. Um, that's a really tough one, Mark. I mean, you know, here the hot I, seat is supposed to be hot. No, it's harder than did. the it's you, harder than the other part. I see what you did here. You got me going on food and reading, and you know, I was just like, this is going to be easy, but no, sure. um, no. I think that the for a student, okay, college should be a great three or four or five years of your life it shouldn't be the best three or four or five, or five years of your life. It should set you up for a lot of other things. And if you, if you mess up, which I don't think anyone ever messes up, it's okay. Um, if you have to press pause and go do something else, one of my closest friends, um, you know, decided that halfway through college, he needed to do something else, went off, did something else, came right back, had a 4.0 GPA the rest of his time. So it's... That's a good point. There's more than one way to do college. You can take the circuitous route. And, I mean, he just graduated from a, a top 20 MBA program and, you know, is doing amazing things. For a parent, um, it's okay if your kid makes mistakes. It's perfectly fine. Nothing is ever earth shatteringly I shouldn't say nothing is ever earth shatteringly bad but so what you know if 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 they don't get a perfect 36 or 1600 or if they don't make you know if they if they're not student body president or anything like that the, the important thing is for them to come into their own and you know it's something that um I constantly push is that you know we can get really excited about these rankings overseas and how relatively for some students how relatively easy it is for them to slide right into you know a place at a top 20 global university but you know if they're miserable then what's the point and ultimately you know i think that and i've definitely had situations where i've worked with a family they've they've poured their heart and soul into something and you know that they realized at the last minute, Hey, this other option may be the one I'm looking for. And you know, it's ultimately you want the kid to be happy. You know, that's great advice. And I would actually even go one step further than that. Yeah. I would even go one step further. I mean, even if they flunk out, I mean, listen, I would be mortified if my kids flunked out. I just, I would, I'm being honest. Like that's just, you know, I was raised by two educators, but they'll still be okay. There's lots of jobs out there. There's lots of, 
And certain things would be cut off, obviously. But I think sometimes we make too big of a deal out of grades or even, to be honest, a college degree. And right. I know a college degree is a, is a pathway to a whole lot of jobs and a whole lot. But if, and if, you, if you give me someone that doesn't have a college degree, but, but they work really hard and we find something that they're good at and they're passionate about and they have good people skills and a high level of personal integrity, I can find a whole bunch of things they can do. They might go be a million dollar realtor on me. Right. You know, there's, there's, there's zillions of different things that people can do quite honestly. So, uh, as much as we're a college podcast, um, I don't want us to take this so seriously that we get it twisted. Exactly. And obviously that's, you know, pretty extreme. I mean, funking out is not the same as not getting a 1600 or 36. I get right. it, but I just wanted to make a point. I just wanted no, to make a point. I, I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. And that, um, there's so much pressure. And I think right now we're a conversation that as an industry, we need to do a better job of having is mental health for students. Yeah. And yeah. ultimately I, I want to work with people who are happy and excited and not staying up till 2 AM doom scrolling through TikTok. you know, because they, they can have control of that part of their day, but when they wake up, it's a whole new level of, things they're going to have to deal with that they don't feel that they can take on, you know. Um, I'm not saying wake up at 4 a.m. and, tack, you know, that you have to have that tackle the day mentality every day, but definitely I think take we need to take a step back and, you know, realize that your kid's more important than just about anything. Certainly. Yeah, in, their in health, health, physical and mental health. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I mean, 3% of people who apply to a place like Harvard or Stanford are going to get in. And those 97% are still rock stars. And the millions of kids who don't apply to places like that are still awesome. So I think that, you know, just that's my thing. You know, it's, uh, it's something that I'm, I'm very biased towards the international system is, you know, abundantly clear, but it's not for everyone sure. and that's perfectly fine. And it's, it's not for everyone from an academic standpoint. It's not for everyone from a social standpoint or from any other number of things. And I think that finding that best fit, that's ultimately what's important. Well, Kevin, I call that a drop the mic moment. You can't, we have to stop on that. That's, that's, that's leaving with a crescendo. So um, you survived the hot seat. You flourished in style. So now you're, now you're, <laughs> you had to sweat a little bit, but that's just it's the little. hot seat. I'm. It's not the cold seat. You're supposed to sweat. <laughs> Thanks so much, my friend, and um, we'll look forward to having you back in a few months to to talk about another international university. So keep Absolutely, up the good work. Mark. And once again, why don't you tell our listeners again how they can contact you if they might be interested in a Dutch university or quite honestly anywhere outside of uh, the U.S. or Canada. Sure. Um, feel free to visit my website, www.aneducationabroad.com. Um, or you can email me directly at kevin at aneducationabroad.com. And if you forget all the, that stuff, uh, Kevin's picture and his information and links are also up um, um, on our website, schoolmatchforyou.com. So many ways to get to Kevin, and um, he does a complimentary consultation. So if you have interest at all, uh, reach out to him. All right. Thanks, Kev. Thanks, Mark. Next week in the news, did Columbia game the U.S. news ranking with sketchy data? A great and very, uh, very uh, provocative article by Jordan Ellenberg of the Washington Post. Our question from a listener is a specific question for Lisa. Lisa, what are your thoughts about the recent article in the Atlantic magazine entitled, Why Are Teens So Sad? That's from Mark from Fairborn, Georgia. Our interview is with Roger Parrott, the president of Belhaven University in Jackson, Mississippi. The topic is, what are the major trends impacting higher education? That's going to be a three-parter. This will be part one of three. And our college spotlight comes back from right in my own backyard. It is the University of Illinois, Chicago, UIC, part one of two. And I'm interested in hearing that spotlight, Mark, because UIC truly is one of these schools that it did sort of like a, a Northeastern. Uh, it went from 
total obscurity and uh, second class status to being uh, one of the most uh, popular choices in the Chicagoland region now. So it's going to be an interesting one. Yeah, no, most definitely. And for someone like you who's into the health sciences, they have so many strong programs in yeah. in, in medical related fields. But friends, I, I, I before I let you go, I have to share something which I am vowed to say every single week. It's not where you go, but it's what you do when you get there. And it's what you do when you get out of there. And college is not a prize to be won, but a match to be made. See you next week, everybody. And on Easter su- Sunday, I got to say preach, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave and I are recording this very early morning on Easter. See you. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter, everybody. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please subscribe so you get every episode as soon as it is released. If you are interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on your favorite podcast listening app. I am the producer of the Your College Bound Kid podcast. We have a fantastic team of nine people. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. David Williams and Dr. Lisa Ruff. Our sound engineer who fixes all of our many errors is Nemanja Modfitch. The amazing music you hear is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Boss. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Dalianas Dimitri. If you want to have a college coaching session with me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want to ask or a college you want Lisa or me to do a spotlight on, or if you have a recommended resource or an article you think we should share, just send it to questions at yourcollegebondkid.com. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you, our family, next week.